Yeah, thank you, Vijay. So this is my last lecture um, for, of the series. I'm lagging a little bit behind in time. That's why I'm still here on, on the level here of lecture three. Um, so I have to finish today lecture three, and then I have to improvise a little bit depending on how time goes to see how much I can talk about lecture four. So let's just continue where I have um, finished yesterday. So I've been discussing the dynamic epithelium, which could be characterized by segmentation of polygonal cell shapes. So I have a meshwork of polygons over time. And I can construct a conjugate triangular network, which carries essentially the same topological information of neighborship of cells and of cell geometries, but in form of a conjugate network. And this turns out to be very useful. Then the first step was to define the deformation tensor, which I can coarse grain on different scales. So I can define it on the scale of a single polygon or triangle. I can define it on the scale of regions of the tissue. I can define it on the scale of the whole tissue. And the deformation tensor is a displacement gradient, but coarse grain, which means averaged over a certain region. This is in two dimensions, a two by two matrix. And we need to decompose it in its essential components. And Guillaume Salbreu has already explained this today. I just want to do it again because it's notationally so important. So we have a matrix with four entries. And we can first decompose it in a symmetric and an anti-symmetric matrix. <clears throat> For that, we have to put on the non-diagonals, the average. And then we compensate with a purely anti-symmetric matrix. Um, and then here's my D. Now the sum of the two is my general matrix. And this symmetric matrix is, describes shear. The anti-symmetric describes rotations, which are not part of the true deformation. And we can also decompose this matrix in the trace and the traceless part. We can write this as a sum of three matrices. Um, will be the trace. And then I have traceless symmetric part, it's then A minus D minus A minus D. I have here plus C over 2, plus C over 2, and I have the anti-symmetric part. Now, this here is essentially the divergence in our case. Yeah? Take the displacement gradients. We can think of this as d alpha u beta. It's now decomposed in the trace part, which is the divergence of u delta alpha beta over 2 plus what I call u tilde alpha beta, the traceless symmetric part of the matrix plus epsilon alpha beta times theta. This is a rotation, infinitesimal rotation angle. And I use this tilde notation for the symmetric traceless part of the matrix. Now in my um, segmentation of the cell mesh, I also have time information about subsequent frames. In addition to the displacement, I also have the time. So I can define the time derivative of the deformation. And that's essentially the velocity gradient or deformation rate tensor, which can similarly be decomposed in the anisotropic part, the traceless symmetric part, pure shear. The isotropic part is now the compression or growth rate. And the rotation is now rotation rate. Now, this is information about changes of the state over time, the deformation 
deformation rate of the material, of the polygons. Uh, a second quantity that we can measure precisely from our triangulation or from our poly um, is what we call the elongation tensor, which characterizes the shape of cells. Whether shapes are isotropic in their geometry or whether they have an axis along which they are extended. And the definition that we're using is based on triangles um, and allows us to use exact geometric relationships. The idea is that every triangle that one can draw can be uniquely generated from an equilateral reference triangle by an affine transformation. And the, the idea is easy to sketch. Yes? Yes. Absolutely. Otherwise, it would not be anti-symmetric. Um, so, I'm starting from an equilateral, I'm trying to draw an equilateral triangle, three equal sides, and I define two vectors along two lines. They call them E1 and E2. You can think of them as a, as a basis. And then I have my arbitrary triangle, which is defined by two vectors, they're called R1 and R2. And now there exists one matrix relating my vectors Ri to Ei by sum over J. And this, this matrix um, defines the triangle. And of course, it depends on the orientation of my reference equilateral triangle. Now, the, inter the, the, the idea is now that we can always, in two dimensions, write this matrix S as a product of two matrices, one symmetric and one a rotation matrix. The rotation matrix essentially orients the reference triangle. So, all possible reference triangle orientations are allowed, and this generates all possible orientations of the triangle we, we want to have, which means if you're only interested in the shape without worrying about the, the orientation, we only have the Q matrix. Yeah? And Q is, is a tensor that therefore characterizes triangles. Now, I'm using it. Um, um, transformations where the area is not changed. So I'm only looking at the shear part of, 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 of the deformation from the equilateral triangle to this triangle. And it implies that this matrix should be should have determinant one. And um, since the rotation matrix has determinant one, I also need this matrix to have determinant one. And this works if Q is traceless. Q is traceless and symmetric. I should maybe clarify the exponential of a matrix is defined via the Taylor expansion of the exponential. Um, so it's Q to the power n, is the matrix multiplication. Um, and if we have, since U is, is, is symmetric, we can always diagonalize it as eigenvalues. So the determinant of, of the exponential of Q is the product of the eigenvalues. It's e to the lambda 1, e to the lambda 2, where lambda 1, lambda 2 are the eigenvalues of the matrix Q. 2 by 2, so there are two of them. And this is, of course, e to the lambda 1 plus lambda 2. And since the matrix is traceless, the sum of the eigenvalues is 0, the determinant is 1. Now, this Q is a traceless two by two tensor, which characterizes an axis and strength of anisotropy of the shape. Not a deformation type of variable, it's a shape characterizing variable. And so it, it, one can define, an, we can write it as a little bar, which defines an axis of elongation, and the length of the bar corresponds to the strength of the elongation. Now, of course, I can also add shape sorry, area changes 
to this formalism, if I start from a reference triangle with a reference area and I have a different area later, there is an, just a scalar factor in front. It doesn't change the definition of my elongation tensor Q. So the elongation tensor Q is defined for a triangle. It's, it's a traceless symmetric matrix, so it can be written in this form where this scalar Q is the strength of elongation and the angle phi is the orientation of this bar relative to the reference frame of, let's say, x-axis in this case, when I, when I use the x-axis component as being the upper left component of this tensor. And the, the fact that there's a 2 phi, the angle means that if you rotate it by 180 degrees, you have the same state as before, and that's because it's not a vector, but a thematic tensor. And if I now look at a cell shape, I just have to average over the triangles that belong to one cell to define the shape tensor of a cell. <clears throat> now, the interesting point or the reason why we use these definitions is that we can now relate the state variable Q, which defines shapes of cells, which can be measured in, in the experiment, um, with the deformation variable U or, or V, which comes from changing from one frame to the next in a movie. So the idea is the following. In, in let's say, in movie frame one, we have a certain triangle locally. In the, in, of course, it's true for many triangles in this movie. Then we go to the next frame, and we have a new triangle. Each of these triangles can be characterized by a shape tensor and by the orientation angle, which is the angle that we need here in this, in this rotation matrix. And one frame later, we have a new shape and a new angle. And they are defined via this affine transformation that I've just used, using the same reference triangle for both states, for both shapes. Now, if I move from this triangle to this triangle in, in the time delta t, the triangle is deformed and is rotated. And that is characterized by my deformation rate tensor. So there is a Deformation tensor, that's the traceless symmetric part here, and there is a rotation that comes from the anti-symmetric part of the, of the uh, tensor, which is an angle change. And with the definitions, we can now have an exact relation between changes in Q in theta and deformations and changes in psi. And I don't want to go into the technicalities here, you find it in this paper, but roughly speaking, the shear deformation for small changes is the same as a change in Q. But it's not quite that simple, because if we have a pure rotation of, of our triangle, there is no shear. U tilde is zero. But U Q changes, because the tensor points now in a different axis. And this equality is therefore only true, and we can derive this rigorously, if delta Q is evaluated in a reference frame that rotates during the process. It's a co-rotational change. And as a result, if we have a pure rotation, delta U is, is zero because the co-rotational delta Q is zero. Now, if we translate this now to a time-dependent process. We take the time derivative on both sides. Then we generate the, the velocity gradient tensor, the traceless part of the velocity gradient tensor. And this is now equal as a time derivative of shape tensor, but it's a time derivative taken in a co-rotating reference frame. This is a so-called co-rotational time derivative. And to indicate that I'm using a capital D here, rather than it's not a normal time derivative. It's a, the corrotational time derivative. And that is an exact relationship because I have defined Q in a way and I've defined my, my deformations in a way so that this is an exact relationship which you can, which you can express in all details, including the proper definition of the um, corrotational time derivative. It turns out to be a bit subtle, so we can look this up in this paper. Yes? We'll come to that. Here, this is for a single triangle. 
The hope is that the triangle exists in two frames, which is not always the case. So for the moment, I'm tracking polygons and triangles, and I wonder that the triangle exists in both frames. I come in a moment to what happens if there's. I think we're using the average of the vertices. It's the fastest way to do it. So now let's look at the shell cell shape dynamics in this tissue. So I'm plotting the Q tensor in red, and I'm averaging Q over a certain region. And then you see here the time dependence of the field of the Q tensor, which starts out quite irregular. And then there's a large scale pattern of aligned cell shape elongation in the tissue, which reaches the maximum in the case. And this we can measure in parallel, where we measure the deformation rate tensor, the, the, the shear rate tensor. And here I show you this data, averaged over the whole blade um, as a function of time. And this is a cumulative shear that is plotted, and it's projected on the x-axis. So it's the x-axis component of my tensors. And I, and I accumulate a tensor over time, which means the slope of the curve is the shear rate. And that's just a representation with much less noise. If I directly plot the rate as a function of time, you get very noisy curves. And this is a way to get very smooth curves. So you see there, the tissue shears continuously, stretching along the horizontal axis. Um, and the shear rate decreases a little bit, but it's always positive. The cell elongation increases, reaches the maximum, and decreases. That's what you just saw in the movie before. And this is now average of the whole tissue. For the single triangle case, I chose definitions so that these tonalities would have to be equal. Yeah? That V should, has to be D, DU, DT. But for the reason that was already indicated, because in this tissue there are cell division, cell rearrangements, the, the collective values of U and DU, DT and uh, U and DQ, DT um, can differ. And in, interestingly, the cells deform more strongly and the tissue. So you have a tissue that stretches, but inside the cells on average stretch more than the tissue stretches up to this point here. And then suddenly the cells relax their stretching, but the tissue continues to elongate. So the tissue, I sketched this here, undergoes shear because it is attached to a rigid frame, which is the cuticle that was secreted earlier. It's a rigid material, sort of part of the exoskeleton of the, of the, of the insect, which is used here during development to provide a scaffold. And attached to the scaffold, the hinge region of the tissue contracts. And this, this, this generates shear on the tissue, but at the same time, cells change their shape in a surprising way. Now let's first try to understand um, what these two curves mean. And if we have no rearrangements of cells, if the cells keep their neighbors all the time, then a shape change of a, of a group of cells or of a tissue is directly related to the shape change of the cells. And in that case, the tissue shear rate would be this rotational time derivative of the cell shape. Um, cell shape. However, the, shear can, the, the, the tissue can also change its shape without cells changing their shape if the cells rearrange. That is typically seen, for example, in a T1 process. If I start with this group of cells, which have isotropic in their shape, two and four are neighbors. Now I go through a T1 transition, where this bond shrinks, fourfold vertex, a new vertex opens. And now one and three are, are neighbors, and two and four have moved apart. And you see already in this example that the shape of the patch has changed. So there is tissue shear because of rearrangement if the cell shape doesn't change. And that implies that we, the total tissue shear can be written as contribution from cell shape changes and the contribution from rearrangements. And I call the shear due to rearrangements capital R. It's a shear rate. And it's a traceless symmetric tensor. And since the two have to add up, it's sort of, one can imagine what it looks like. So the red plus the green gives the blue. And the, the green curve is steeper than the blue curve because the red curve has a negative slope initially. And as the green curve goes through a maximum and changes slope, the red curve changes the slope. And the, the red curve is the contribution to tissue shear because cells rearrange. 
Now we can do that in, in a more explicit way, so we can actually measure contribution to tissue shear stemming from different rearrangements of the meshwork. So we have T1 transitions which exchange neighbors, but we also have cell divisions and we have cell extrusions, all of which imply that if you track polygons, there are polygons appearing and disappearing, and then you have, when you have to be careful about how to define our quantities. And uh, we can define now this R is the sum of contributions of these different processes which you can separate. And the idea is the following, which I want to um, highlight on this slide. If you go through a T1 transition from this configuration to, to such a configuration, then before the T1 transition, my triangulation, the conjugate lattice, would have these two triangles. And when I go through this transition, I switch the definition of my triangulation. So I, I switch these two triangles to these two triangles. Now the outline of these two triangles, this quadrilateral, doesn't change its shape. But inside the triangles are flipped. And this means that there is instantaneously no overall tissue shear, but a sudden change in Q of the triangles. And one can now define the contribution to shear, R, as an instantaneous contribution proportional to this switch in Q. So you get, at each instant of a remeshing, you get a delta pulse proportional delta Q. So this is, becomes as units of a shear rate, yeah, because the delta function is in inverse time. And this then overall satisfies uh, this relation that the tissue shear plus the dQ dt plus R is, is matched. And that, that way we can define the independent contribution and in the end the overall um, sum is obeyed. And it's an exact relationship that we can decompose V in contributions. Yeah, I just want to show you um, in this case the more refined um, decomposition, cell elongation, tissue shear. Now these are only T1 transitions and then I have cell division separately. Cell extrusions are so small but doesn't really see their contribution to shear. There's something um, which I just want to hint at, given the time, and that is because I coarse grain over a large region, spatial inhomogeneities generate a contribution which we call a correlation contribution, and that can be shown uh, related to correlations between rotations and changes in Q that stem from the fact that you have this rotational time derivative and this introduces nonlinearities, which together with my averaging of a fluctuating system sort of renormalizes um, shear. And that is a con contribution that we can explicitly measure here. But in the following, I will just add up these terms, T1 and the, the purple and the orange, and call it R. That's the shear due to rearrangements. And, and um, I will focus on this representation. So this is close to the T1 transitions, but there can be a few other contributions in it, for example, from cell divisions, from cell extrusions. So let's look at what this, how the system behaves. At early times, I already highlighted, the cells elongate more than the tissue. What does this mean? Schematically, it's illustrated here. Um, the tissue stretches along the horizontal axis, which is schematically indicated that this is more stretched than this. At the same time, T1 transitions are such that on the horizontal axis, they tend to um, contract bonds and then open new, new bonds in the perpendicular direction. And in this case, these T1 transitions, they, the ectomycin has to pull against the tendency of the tissue to elongate. This is, as I'll show later, an active process. And um, I call this an active T1 transition. And as, as a result of that, the cells elongate more strongly because, for example, these cells are neighbors and now they have are not neighbors, now they become neighbors, so they have to stretch more. Now at later times, the slopes have changed their sign, and what that means is that now the T1 transitions happen oppositely, so now it's these bonds that shrink, and the T1 transitions open new bonds in the, along the axis where the tissue itself is sort of extending, and this, in this case the T1 transitions follow passively the tendency of the stress set by the stress on the tissue. And I always sort of can identify the directions of the tensor delta Q by these little bars and the directions of the tensor R by the little bar. And the sum of the two 
essentially cancels you know, it here. Now let's discuss the physics of, of this a bit in, in using the vertex model which I introduced yesterday. Um, and so let's think of a physical model for this network and ask what is the orientation of T1 transitions. And I will consider a situation um, where I add fluctuations to the problem so that they can stochastically happen. First, the meshwork has an elastic modulus. So if I start with the isotropic case, all the tensions on the bonds are the same, so that the, sort of the relaxed state would be isotropic cell shapes, Q equals zero, and if I now stretch this meshwork, I get bonds of unequal lengths here, and in parallel, the stress in the tissue will be anisotropic. I have a tissue shear stress which increases with uh, Q as Q becomes non-zero, and I can define an elastic modulus, shear elastic modulus, which is a linear coefficient between these two, which is the property of my mechanics of my, of my meshwork. And if I now ask, in a noisy situation, sort of what we typically do is we'll be having average values for the bond tensions plus fluctuations, and then there's a probability for T1 transitions to happen. And if the cells are isotropic, T1 transitions will also be isotropic. All axes of bonds, bond orientation, that disappear of form um, is not biased. At the moment, the shape of cells is unequal, it has an, has an axis of elongation, then it's a, there is a higher probability for the short bonds to disappear and then longer bonds to form than the other way around. And this suggests that the contribution to shear R, that is tensor, is parallel to the, to the Q tensor. And, and this can be written as a phenological equation that R is, some, is proportional to Q and there's a phenological coefficient which has units of time, inverse time, because Q is dimensionless and R is a rate. And this gives me now a simple model for, 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 for how such a teacher behaves. And I show you this is an example of a noisy simulation of this vertex model. So in this case, I start with a rectangle and then I, then I force it with external forces to be stretched. And you see the decomposition here on the right. The overall shear is this blue curve. So there's a time when I have a constant shear rate and I have changed the shape of the box. And then you see the other curves. The, the orange curve is how the cells are deformed by this external force. So they go to a small deformation which is stationary while this still forms. And the T1 transitions generate somehow this, uh, allow for the shear deformation to take place. They are shown in, in red. Now, we can test the idea of the simple model, for example, by looking at how the cell elongation relaxes after we've deformed the tissue. So this is now, I'm starting at a moment where the tissue shear, shear is, is finished. Cells are, are, are anisotropic, and then they relax back to the isotropic state. And this happens with T1 transitions that are shown here in red. Maybe you can just sketch. Um, where this then comes, comes from. So, so I have, um, these are my constitutive, my constitutive equations. R is proportional to Q, sigma is proportional to Q, and I have this constraint. In this case, I relax at constant box because it's after the shear has happened, so V is zero. So, so from this, um, since V is zero, I have dQ dt equals minus r, and r is 1 over tau q, so we have dq dt um, equals minus 1 over tau q, and this gives an exponential relaxation um, at the characteristic time scale tau, which is, which is essentially what you see. I thought I had a slide which shows the exponential function, but this can be well fit by an exponential function. We can also get this way d. R of T. So now a more interesting situation is a case where signal processes self yes. In your case, uh, when we are when the cell is expanding in one direction, there is a contraction in the perpendicular direction, right? Which is happening because of the shear. But does does that happen in experimental when cells are elongating their widths also significantly decrease? Because the 
it can be the heights that are reducing, but in place. I'm, I'm talking here on purpose about a model and not about an experiment. Because in experiments, many, many, many different things happen. I don't, we have a particular experiment we want to understand, which we'll come to maybe later. But right now, I'm only explaining a model. So what happens if you make certain assumptions? What to explain the physics of that? Um, yes? OK, so here's no shear. Here's shear. Here's no shear. And at last slide, I only look at the time up here, I'm looking at this relaxation process. So I go to this po time point, and this is the relaxation process. Of course, I can also talk about the other process, but the whole thing can be discussed with the same model. Yeah? I just wanted to show you the simple case, which is easy to understand. A T2 are isotropic, yeah, in some sense. So this is a more a subtle question, which I don't want to address here right now. The T1 coupling is direct because this is both a tensorial um, structure of the same type. Um, yes? The previous slide. Uh, one more. Uh, so R is directly proportional to Q, right? But even when Q decreases, are, oh, this is cumulative. Yeah, but plot always cumulative. The slopes are the rates. Then I would like to discuss the same problem, but now I assume there is some anisotropy in the tissue. It could be a planar cell polarity type molecular anisotropy or some signaling, some, some, some sensorial signal, which which decides that certain bond orientations have higher tension than other bond under orientations. In this case, the blue bonds would be at higher tension than the green bonds. And I have some local anisotropy, which is defined by the tensor little q. You can think of this as an anisotropy in the tissue, which could be PCP-like, planar cell polarity-like. And in this situation, already when q is zero, when the cells are isotropic, is the stress in the tissue anisotropic because there's a different stress in this axis and on this axis. So then I have to complement my constitutive equation for the stress. I add to the shear modulus term a term with a coefficient proportion to little q, which accounts, which describes the stress if q is zero that exists. And, and usually we think of this as an active stress in the tissue because the, the difference of these, these Bond tensions come from the actomyosin system and its regulation in the, in the cell. You think of this as an active stress and of the type that Guillaume Salbreu also introduced this morning. I don't understand the question. There's an anisotropy in the tissue where you just have one overall field. And also, this is a schematic argument. Now you can ask how to do that exactly in a model, and I don't want to go into all the subtleties here. No? This, is, this is just a basic symmetry yeah. argument. And I can now look at such a situation where I actually do that by imposing now bonds depending on their angle, different, giving them different tensions. And what happens now is that we get a bias of T1 transition because of these differences in, in bond tension. Yeah? So what typically happens if the cells are isotropic in their shape, even though now the lengths of the bonds are all the same, the tension is different. And therefore, it's, it is, we would expect it's more likely for the higher tension bond to contract. And then you open up one of the lower tension bonds perpendicularly, and the opposite. So in this case, it's the little Q tensor, which sets the orientation of T1 transitions. And you see that if Q is perpendicular, R should be horizontal. And what happens now if you take, do the simulation on a box which does not change its shape is that cells need to elongate along the axis of Q because the QDT is minus R. And so Q changes. So we start from isotropic cells. They must elongate this way. And this can now be characterized. Yeah, first, let me show you the shear decomposition of this case. So we have. Um, no shear because the whole box, I didn't, allow them, I didn't allow it to move. Now I get T1 transitions which are biased. 
and they are along this axis while Q is perpendicular. And in tensors, if you have a perpendicular orientation, you have a negative sign. Um, so R is proportional to Q, but this coefficient lambda is negative. And the cell elongation goes the other way, goes in the perpendicular axis. And I now have to complement my constitutive equation for, for the rate of shear due to T1 transitions by adding to the passive term this active term. This is now an active T1 transition term. And now um, let's make this more clear with the, what I mean by active and passive T1 transitions. Um, So I can somehow discuss the energetics of my, of my work function. I introduced yesterday this work function for the vertex model, which is something like an effective potential for these polygonal cell shapes. I can now ask, what, how can I do the energy balance of this work function when I have, let's say, external forces acting on a tissue and I have T1 transitions? And the T1 transitions can also sort of perform work on the tissue if there is actomyosin contracting and there is a chemical energy supply, or the T1 transition could just relax energy and dissipate it as heat. And so I think of a piece of tissue. And this, I have a certain value, W of my work function. In the, in the continuum limit, which I just introduced, um, is sort of the work function per area given by my um, um, elastic, she elastic energy, so I can write it in the form one half K Q alpha beta, Q alpha beta, where I sum over both indices. A shorter form to write this is Q dotted with Q. And then from my active uh, stress term, I get also contribution zeta Q dotted with Q. So that the derivative of W with respect to Q gives me the stress. And now I can ask, so I would like to see that W dot, the time derivative, is the sum of the mechanical work that I may perform from outside, plus the exchange of energy via the T1 transition. So I, have a, I can work on the tissue mechanically, or I can work on the tissue via T1 transitions. And I would like to identify these two terms, how, to, how, how, I, how I should write them. Now to do that, you can first note that W dot over A is given by one over A E W E Q times Q dot. And this, this is in fact a stress. This is sigma alpha beta Q alpha beta dot alpha beta. Any questions? I hear some noises now. What well, I can also directly calculate is double do dot mechanical. So if I now exert external forces on the tissue, how do I change um, the energy? That's essentially an integral over the boundary where these forces act. So I allow now the forces to, to act at the boundary. F external times the velocity at the boundary. That is, is a vector. And now using the stress tensor, I can write this as a normal vector on the surface times the stress tensor. So this is the same as the force at the boundary times the velocity. And now I can use Gauss theorem to turn To turn, to turn this into a, um, into a service integral. Okay. 
So if this surf integral can, can be expressed as a boundary integral, and I use now that force balance implied that d beta sigma alpha beta equals zero, and then this is simply integral over the area sigma alpha beta times d beta v alpha. So it's a stress tensor times the velocity gradient. And if the system is homogeneous, I have the W mechanical divided by the area, so this, the integral is just a factor of, of the area, is then sort of sigma times v. This is my velocity gradient, my shear rate, and this is my stress tensor. Pardon? So if this here has the same value everywhere in the tissue, then I can also do everything locally. It's, it, there's nothing, there's nothing, yeah, they don't make an approximation here. I can also directly do it locally, but I, um, so now I can identify my quantities of interest um, because I can now use that V is the QDT plus R. Um, so if this here is now sigma times DQ DT plus R. Or the other way around, I can, can say that V dot over A equals W dot mechanical over A um, minus sigma times R. And now I find that W dot 31 transitions equals minus sigma times R. That's the work performed by the T1 transitions. And that's what I'm writing here. And the point is that if this is negative, then it goes out of the tissue. And if it is positive, then it goes into the tissue. So a passive T1 transition is, is one where W dot is work released from the tissue to the outside. And that's what I call a passive T1 transition. And in this first case, which I sketched my model, that's exactly what happens if you, if you look at the definitions. That's a passive T1 transition. And if, I, if we take the anisotropic version, where it's the bond tension which drives T1 transitions, then we can change the sign of minus R times sigma, and it becomes an active T1 transition. And we can also use that concept to understand which T1 transitions are passive and active in um, our experiment. But for that, we need to understand what a stress is. And because in order to, to know the sign of R times R, we can measure easily, just from the geometry. I showed you how to measure it. What is harder to know is what is actually the sign of sigma in the tissue. And one of the preferred experiments is using labels, laser ablation, which gives you maybe not the value of sigma, but gives you an indication of the the sign of the orientation. Yeah. For example, in our pupil wing, we can make circular laser ablations. So we cut a line of the tissue. The tissue can relax mechanically. And because there is an anisotropic stress in the tissue, it relaxes and opens up an ellipsoidal shape. Now we can measure the axis of this ellipsoid. Um, now the isotropic part of the response is, is sort of the average of the two axes and the anisotropic part my, my traceless contribution is the difference of the two axes. And this is plotted here. The velocity, anisotropic velocity, is a function of the elongation, the shape of cells in the region where the cut takes place. And then one can actually fit this model you know, to, this, to this line. And we can sort of then use the, the ideas that I just illustrated in the model also to, to say that these transitions are active in the, in the, in the real tissue. 
So by doing that, we can now build with these arguments a continuum theory of the material that is based on cell shape, elastic moduli of cells, the geometric relationship between tissue shear, cell shape changes, and shear due to rearrangements. Um, it's based on this constitutive equation with elastic modulus and active stresses. And in the simplest form, we have a constitutive equation for the T1 transitions and how they affect tissue shear. Uh, in the simplest form, has this, this term proportional to Q, which gives the stress relaxation and sort of a viscoelastic relaxation time um, this problem, and an active term which describes how active T1 transitions can, can generate cell rearrangements against the tendency of the geometry of the cells in the tissue. I can also write down an equation for the isotropic part, which I don't do here, just keep it simple. We need force balance um, equations, and then this provides a continuum theory for the tissue dynamics that is coarse-grained, so it's no longer based on having individual cells like the vertex model, but it still carries the geometry of cells in this Q tensor. So there is an average, the Q tensor provides a pneumatic field on the tissue, even at a coarse grained limit that governs tissue dynamics. And since I'm far with time, and since I still have another subject to discuss, I will just very quickly mention that we've applied this approach to the pupil flywing, um, both the wild type and this dumpy mutant, which I illustrated yesterday, which has this um, shape, phenotype, misformed shape of the wing. Um, interestingly, the, the, the phenotype becomes really apparent in the pupil stage when we look at this process. So it really happens at that time when we look at it. You see initially the two are, look quite nice, and only at the end do you see that the mutant has a, has a problem. And so we can apply our continuum theory with boundary conditions to this problem, and we have done it in a, in a very simplified manner, by representing the, the wing essentially by rectangular pieces. <coughs> the, the cuticle is represented by an outer frame. There are boundary conditions that allow, for example, an elastic linkage uh, with elastic linkers. They are important for the wild type, and in the mutant, we, we just allow these, these elastic linkers to change or to disappear while keeping the material properties of the tissue the same. And here I show you sort of a comparison. This is, this is the rectangular model. This indicates the cell shape, the average cell shape in this field in the model and overlaid to the actual shape of the, of the tissue. And here is our shear decomposition Solid lines are the measured ones, and the dashed lines are the solutions of the model. And so we account here for the overall tissue shear, we account for the cell shape changes and for the T1 transitions in this model, but as a sort of a mean field approach and average over the whole, the whole tissue. And the dumpy mutant, we can, by only changing boundary conditions, we can account for the, for the um, phenotype that leads to a malformed, misformed shape. Okay, so um, my timing is such that now I come to the last part of my series, and I have to see that I do that in more sort of half an hour. I'm not sure I have enough time. So I will improvise a little bit or leave out things. Um, so I switch gears completely, and I have to see, I have to see how, I, how I do it, because I cannot do it as carefully and thoroughly as I did the other things. So the, the, the interest now is I have a tissue which has the biophysics that I've outlined, that is dynamic, that is an active material, and on this tissue I want now to understand how signaling processes can be established that can be also used to control growth. And that has been work over a number of years with a group of Marcos Gonzalez Gaitan, um, and I'd like to highlight Daniel Aguilar Hidalgo, Pierre Mumku, Stefan Werner, and um, Otto Wartlich was very important over many years and currently working with Zena and with Maria. 
And this is again is motivated by the fly wing. In this case, we're focusing on the earlier stages. I just was talking about the pupa, and now I'm talking about the wing imaginal disc as it grows um, earlier. And I've already mentioned to you that it grows over five days, about 10 rounds of cell division. And here I show you a quantification of this growth. That's sort of what we are now interested in as a phenomenon. This is the area of the wing disc as a function of time in hours. This is data is for two different um, cases. One is the normal wild type, one has a GFP DPP, which has a, sl a small perturbation. And this is a single logarithmic plot here, so that the slope of one of these fit curves is the growth rate, the area growth rate. I call the area growth rate G, it's an inverse time. And it's sort of the time derivative of the area divided by the area. And what you can see is that the growth rate slows over time. That's one of the problems that we've also heard um, this morning about a system that grows up to a certain size. And here it does so by continuously slowing down growth until growth stops. And this can be fit by an exponential function. It's a maximum growth rate G naught, time T naught. And then the growth rate, it decays exponentially. And if I take such a rule, a simple exponential decay of the growth rate, and I integrate this to get the area as a function of time, that's the function one gets. And this function is fit here. That's a fit function. This describes the data really very well. And there's a single parameter, that's tau. That's the time over which the growth rate decays. And in the fly wing, this is about 30 hours. And that's a phenomenon which I would like to understand. I will also take into account later that the growth is not purely isotropic, because the area measures only the isotropic part, but there are anisotropies of growth, that the, that the linear length grows like the area to the, or the area goes like the linear length to the power one plus epsilon, because the two axes grow at different rates, and this epsilon is, is known, we can measure it. Now, a second feature that is really important is that this growth is to a very good approximation spatially homogeneous. It's not, not strictly spatially homogeneous, but it's roughly homogeneous. So in the sense, if you, if you label dividing cells in the tissue um, by fluorescent label, as done here, you see the mitotic cells as little white spots. And the whole tissue is sprinkled with white spots in a statistical manner, but, but it's evenly sprinkled, yeah, at least on the level of um, taking some averages. You don't see gradients or, or patterns of, of cell divisions, of growth. So we, we say the system is essentially spatially homogeneously growing. So the question I want to address in this last part is how can we organize a collection of cells in such a tissue, biophysics that I've outlined, so that it grows homogeneously, collectively, to a final size that is set by the growth process. And, of course, I would like to see it grow with this exponential decaying growth rate in order to understand where this comes from. Now, an important ingredient for the growth and its stimulation and regulation in the tissue um, is the gr gradient of DPP, which is already introduced in other talks. Picapentaplegic is a morphogen-like molecule which is secreted in a source region which is actually um, set with the help of the anterior-posterior compartment boundary and hedgehog signaling that defines the DPP source. Now DPP is a, is a ligand that is secreted and spreads in the tissue and then forms concentration gradients and here you see a GFP labeled DPP where we can quantify these profiles. And the red curve is data of DPP, um, which shows that this is a graded profile that decays over a distance of tens of, mi of micrometers. Here we fit an exponential function to it to find the range lambda of this profile. Now let's think in terms of from a theory how we would want to write um, the equations for such a gradient and, and, and We've also seen this before, in particular um, in the lectures by Tim Saunders. The simplest picture is a diffusion 
the degradation type of scenario. More space here. And so I write this here. C is my concentration field of my morphogen. And U is the secretion rate at position X. That's where the source is. Then it can diffuse with the diffusion coefficient D. It's degraded at the rate K. And if it happens on a tissue that itself grows, then there is a cell velocity field describing the motion of cells. And this gives a convection term in this equation. Now, often one neglects this convection term because cells move very little. The cell growth rate is very small. And if the tissue is more or less stationary, we can also neglect the time derivative. And we only look at a steady state based on diffusion and degradation. And that is solved by an exponential function that we have steady state 0 equals d times dx square c minus ac. And then we have c of x as steady state, or the c0 e to minus x over lambda. And lambda is given by the square root of d over k. And that's sort of why we often fit exponential functions. Um, now, I want to use this graded profile, and that's now, let's say, this is a, I will build a model to account for the observations, and I will use this summer to make a hypothesis of how growth might be controlled. And so I want to use this morphogen profile to control growth. And this fits in the context of other ideas about how morphogen profiles could control growth, or how growth could be controlled. This was also discussed before. Um, so one I, early idea was that it somehow is the, the slope of the gradient which stimulates growth. And one should say the reason why such ideas come up is because the growth is homogeneous while the profile is graded. So you cannot directly use the profile to control growth. If you want to use it to control growth, you have to think what could be the relationship. And therefore also the, the idea that mechanical stresses might be key to, to compensate for, for what the gradient does. Um, which was also already mentioned this morning. And our approach is different from the others in, in that it emphasizes temporal changes as being key for stimulation of growth. So the idea is that changing DPP levels that cells perceive stimulate growth. And then I want to show you that with this idea, one can actually account for, for many of the observations. Let's first look at how DPP evolves in time in the growing wing disk. These are now profiles measured in wing disks at different times after egg laying. And at during these times, the wing disk grows. So this is for a small disk, this is for a bigger disk, and this is for a large wing disk. And we can always fit exponential functions with a time-dependent C0 and a time-dependent lambda. And we can ask, how does this change over time? And then some interesting scaling properties become striking in the data. One is that as the tissue grows, the range of the profile extends with the size of the tissue. So here I have the size, the linear extension of the tissue, and here I have the extension of the gradient, and there is sort of a linear relationship between the two. And then we have another scaling property, that is the amplitude of the profile increases during growth. You, know, you see, that, see that here, the amplitude goes up. And if we plot the amplitude of the profile versus the area of the disk, this is now a double logarithmic plot, and this gives us a linear relationship which defines a power law. So there is a power law relation between the amplitude and the size. And both phenomena together we, we call a scaling. There are different scaling properties during growth that we would like to understand. And one can also highlight that by um, plotting the profiles on a rescaled positional axis, which goes from 0 to 1, 1 corresponding to the size, so r is a relative position, and then scaling all the maxima to 1. 
And from this, we find that the data collapses. And I can think of the profile as a function of position and time as a time-dependent amplitude multiplied by a time-independent time shape function that we see here, which only depends on the relative position. That's scaling. And one can ask, of course, what is the relevance of such scaling? It certainly hints at being related to the fact that these morphogenetic patterning systems are scalable pattern generators. You know, they must the same um, sort of genetic systems, the same signaling pathways are used to build structures and morphologies of similar type but of different sizes. Right? And so one idea is that the scaling is a manifestation of the scalable uh, organization of the, of the whole system. Now, we would now it turns out, as I'll show you, that the scaling helps us to use the system for growth control. And so the first thing I will show you is that if it scales, growth control is somehow natural and, and, and simple. And then later, I will, if we have enough time, I will show you that the fact that it scales is also natural under certain conditions. But before doing that, let me first um, say a little bit about scaling. I don't, will not say much about this here today. This is something which has been also pioneered by Nama Barkai. And um, she has proposed several systems that can achieve scaling in such a diffusion degradation problem. Um, so there are different scenarios out, out there. Um, one basic idea is that if you have a de decay range of the gradient d over k, if you modulate these two parameters, you can modulate the length. And one way to do it is to get a linear relationship is to decrease the degradation rate with system size. And there's evidence that this actually happens on a wing disk um, from work with, our work with Marcos Gonzalez, where we're using FRAP to analyze the kinetics of, of gradient formation. And there is, there is evidence that the degra degradation rate actually changes with system size. But as I'll show you later, the whole scenario, that's not the, the, the full story. And there's still many open questions to, to the scaling issue. But let's take for the moment scaling for granted. It exists in the system. And let's discuss how we can use a scaling morphogen profile to control growth in a way that's consistent with the, the observations. So the observation is, for example, that the amplitude behaves like a power law relative to the area. And this implies that if I now take time derivatives on both sides, that the relative rate of change of my overall amplitude of the profile is proportional to the relative rate of change of the area. And the proportionality is exactly the exponent of this power law. It's just a mathematical consequence of the power law itself. Now, the relative rate of change of the area is, not, is, is the growth rate. That's the thing we, we would like to understand. We see here that the, there's a correlation between the relative rate of change of the amplitude of the morphogen profile and the growth rate. Now, we're having a morphogen profile which has this scaling property. And this scaling property now implies something interesting. Namely, when I calculate the rate of change of the concentration, but I do that, I, I, I'm calculating this while the cell moves in the, in the growing tissue. So what I have to calculate then is what I call C dot. That is the rate of change of the concentration in the reference frame of the moving cell in the tissue. So this is now the partial time derivative of C x comma t plus a term that comes from convection, v times grad c. That's the this rate of change that a cell perceives in the growing tissue. And the velocity v comes from the growth. In fact, we must have that the growth rate, which is a dot over a, is the divergence of the velocity field. As I explained before, the diversion of the velocity is the isotropic part of the information tensor which describes growth. It um, 
So, so now if the scales, I have a velocity in this case with the x component, which is x over L dL dt in the perfectly, if you have homogeneous growth, and if I now have scaling, it turns out that this relationship is true not only for the magnitude of the whole profile, but at every point in the profile. So I will find that c dot over c at any position and time um, is beta times g, where g is the growth rate. And that, fo that follows from scaling. So this comes if, if it scales. And so I have this relationship, which I, is an approximation, of course. It's, it's a correlation I see in the data. And now the idea is to not just think of this as a correlation, but to make the hypothesis that it's a causal relationship. That is the, that is the in relative rate of change of the concentration that a cell moving in the tissue perceives that actually causally determines the growth rate. And that G is set this way. And that's, 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 our, that's our hypothesis, that changes of, of the signal, of the DPP signal that cells perceive in the, in the tissue, stimulates growth and sets the growth rate. And that's, of course, that's something which we cannot read from the data. The data only show the correlation. There's now a hypothesis that we can test in experiments. So we have a profile which increases over time, and this drives growth in the tissue. I will show you it drives homogeneous growth. Um, and beta, the exponent here is a dimensionless number, is now a parameter of the system that regulates growth. It's sort of a very complex signaling pathway, the DPP signaling pathway in the, in the, in the cells. It takes um, the information of, from binding of ligands to receptors, and which, which then triggers the gene expression and so on. And this pathway, which then at some point has an output that, ha con that regulates or changes growth of, of cells, can be summarized. There's only one parameter that matters here of this whole system, that is the value that it generates of this number beta. And just to give a basic idea of what this type of rule implies, it looks maybe um, at first a bit unnatural, but it turned out to be a very natural and simple situation. It's a situation where you have an adaptive sensor Systems that, sensor, sensory systems or signaling pathways which detect relative changes, something which is very common, there's something which Uri Allen calls full change detection, you find in many different cases. And you find it, for example, in all sensory systems because it, it's an adaptive property. You find it, for example, in chemotactic signaling of bacteria, but also in other sensory systems. And the point is that you want to have a sensor that becomes more sensitive when signals are weak and becomes less sensitive if signals are strong. And a way to do that is to measure relative changes. Yeah, so if, if, you are sensitive, if, if, if the signal output is proportional to delta C over C, then you have an adjustable sensitivity. You adapt to the strength of the signal. And that allows you to be able to detect signals over a broad range of stimuli. And the only thing that we have to assume here is that the DPP system is built like that. It's an adaptive sensor, which does full change detection and generates uh, averaging over short times of the internal system, uh, changes of C in a relative way and measures effectively C dot over C. And of course, the, I wrote down G equals beta minus one C dot over C. Um, that can only be true in a, in a certain linear regime where signals are small. So overall, we have to think of a growth rate which is stimulated by C dot over C. If the stimulus is weak, we have here this linear behavior with a slope 1 over beta. But clearly, the growth rate cannot exceed certain limits. So there is certainly a maximal growth rate a system can, will, will, will achieve, and that there must be some saturation. But as long as we're operating in this small regime, we can use this equation. That's what I want to do following the remaining part of this, of this talk. So what we are actually have to do is to, to, to study the properties of the system is to, to start from this dynamic equation for our morphogen profile with a cell velocity 
being generated by gro the growth rate. And then going into the co-moving frame of cells, cal calculating the co-moving rate of change divided by C, calculate the growth rate, and this then sets our velocity profile, and then go sort of forward in time. And I would like to briefly give you an idea of, because this is an interesting nonlinear system, which is very unusual, even though this equation looks very familiar. I want to give you an idea about what this system, how one can think of this system. So I, I start with the equation for C, and the first thing I can do is kind of expand the convection term. So I, I have DTC, and I have two terms. I have invited this as a divergence of V times C plus V dot grad C. On the right-hand side, I have my diffusion term, degradation term, and source. And now you see that this here is just a growth rate. And then you have these two here together, which give you, that's, that's the term that we need for C dot equals DTC plus V grad C for the convected time derivative that the cells perceive when they move in the tissue. What it means is we can write this equation as C dot, but this is now the co-moving uh, rate of change equals D times a diffusion term. And now I can put this on the other side. I have here K plus G times C plus the source. Now I can also use my growth rule, which says G, eta G equals C dot over C. And can use this equation plus this equation to find an equation for G. Here, I find an equation for G, which is it's new divided by one plus eta C. So this follows from um, eliminating C dot from these two equations, and then writing G as a function of the C and its derivative. And then I can also write a second equation for the time dependence of C. If I now plug this expression of G back in here, I get an equation for C dot. <clears throat> beta over one plus beta, E plus C, Kc plus mu. So in this form, it's a bit clearer what this problem looks like. Yes. Thank you. Now you see, um, if at a given time we have a concentration profile C of x, this determines the instantaneous growth rate from this growth rule. And using this profile, we can now advance C in time. Now, the C dot contains the velocity, and we have to calculate, starting from, from G, knowing the growth rate, we have to calculate the velocity field, which is a mechanical problem in principle. That we have to know material properties of the tissue. In a simple one-dimensional model, one can shortcut this problem. Um, and essentially, so that's now the, my one-dimensional simplification. If I have a line source and I have essentially a one-dimensional problem, I can write G as 1 plus epsilon, but this is the anisotropy of growth, um, Ex Vx, and then I can do everything in one dimension. And I can solve these equations 
in one dimension directly without worrying about the mechanics. All the mechanical aspects are hidden in this anisotropy of growth. Now, this is a nonlinear dynamic problem, which is very non-trivial, and it does not in general generate homogeneous growth. But it has solutions for which growth is perfectly homogeneous and for which gradient scale. So homogeneous growth and gradient scaling are solutions to this problem, to these equations, and it's self-organized. One doesn't have to put it in. It comes out by itself. So here I'm writing this equation in the one-dimensional case. And now it turns out one can ask, under what conditions do we find solutions where growth is homogeneous? And we find them for a particular choice of the parameter beta. As a special point in the problem, as a function of beta, which I now think of as a control parameter, at which growth becomes homogeneous. And we identify this as a critical point in this problem. There's something like a similar to phase transitions in, in critical systems in physics, there is a critical value of this parameter for which suddenly everything becomes simple. Growth is homogeneous and everything scales. And the scaling is a property of the critical system. In this case, also, gradients become exponential um, with a decay length that um, is given here. And the critical value is given here 2 over 1 plus epsilon, where epsilon is my growth anisotropy that I can measure and that I know in the, in the wing disk. Here I show you numerical solutions to these equations in one dimension. If I solve the equations choosing beta at a critical point, this I can do analytically, but so it's not a real surprise, but I can start here with inhomogeneous growth. So this is the growth rate as a function of position. This is the concentration profile in a semi-logarithmic axis. So the straight line is an exponential decay. And the fact that we see only a red curve here, this is for the, the red is the late times and the blue is the early times. You see the size of the tissue over different times. The fact that we see only a red curve is that the other curves are overlaid, so this, it collapses the data. This, this is exact scaling as a result of this critical point. If I go above criticality, um, I find still here approximately, approximate scaling. Um, now the growth here becomes homogeneous. If I, even if I start with inhomogeneous growth at the beginning, the system self-organizes to homogeneous growth, and at the late times it's perfectly homogeneous. If I go beyond the critical point, now growth is no longer homogeneous. There's some profile of growth because I'm away from the critical point. And if I go on the other side, I also lose the exact scaling and I get inhomogeneous growth. Now that's the growth rate as a function of position. What is very interesting to look at is the growth rate as a function of time, which I show here. Um, now at a critical point, the growth rate as a function of time, it decays. But it decays not like an exponential as an experiment, it decays like a power law. And this also implies that growth doesn't stop. If you integrate this growth rate over time with this power law decay, the tissue goes, size goes to infinity. If I go beta smaller beta c, I have still this power law and the tissue grows is an unbounded growth. However, if, if I put beta larger than beta c, the growth um, decays as an exponential. And in this case, we grow towards a finite tissue size. So that's the properties of this model. And what this suggests is that the actual, if, if the tissue follows these rules, that the tissue is not at exactly at a critical point, but is next to it on, the, on, on one side, but the size is finite and growth slows down exponentially. So the, to clarify also this idea of the critical point, I can ask what is the final size of this process um, as a function of my parameter beta? And if beta is bigger than beta c, I said the system grows to a finite size with an exponentially decaying growth rate. And as beta approaches beta c, this final size becomes larger and larger and diverges. And we can, we can calculate in our model the, these properties. And the fact that it's a length scale which diverges at this point sort of highlights the fact that this is like a critical point in physics where you also have diverging length scales. 
At the same time, you go from an exponentially associated divergent <coughs> time scale, yeah, because here, here you have a finite time characterized by the decayed time of the exponential, which was the 30 hours in the case of the, of the fly. And if you go from this exponential to a power law, essentially this time has to diverge. It has all the signatures of a critical point that, we, that we're used to in, in physical systems. Um, so the idea here is we have a system that operates somewhere in the vicinity of a critical point, and because there is a critical point in the problem, we see something that looks like scaling, that looks like homogeneous growth, where in detail, scaling is not exact and growth is not exactly homogeneous. And these ideas we can now also test um, using our vertex model and somehow implement the rules that we determine from this approach in a cell-based model. So we, we take the, 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 the vertex model as I described it before. We have variables for DPP concentration per cell. We also have put in the hedgehog system. We're putting an anterior-posterior compartment boundary to set up the DPP source. The diffusion is described by, by exchange molecules from one cell to its neighbors um, with a parameter that's a degradation rate. Um, here we use, um, we use a system that helps scaling in a so-called expander dilution process, which I don't have time to go into. I should just mention that with these concepts that I've outlined, scaling is an emergent property, but the system may still want to control the, the, the degradation rate over time in order to adjust the growth process and, and, and regulate how, 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 how the, um, the system grows. So, so there is evidence that the degradation rate decreases over time, and this will help sort of drive growth, while scaling is a feature of this critical point in the problem. So we have this time-dependent degradation rate, and we have a rule for cell growth, so that the preferred area of my cells in the vertex model um, changes with time in, in a way that depends on C dot over C, where this is the variable in the, in the cell. And this model can, can account quantitatively also for the, for the wing growth and also for the Haltier growth over time shown here. These are the experimental data, and this is the simulation of this vertex model. I'll show you an example before I finish. Um, yeah, I first show you this vertex model with self-organized growth. The red cells are those which just undergo division. The black cells are waiting for the division event. Division happens when the cell area is doubled, driven by a growth rule. And you see that it starts, the growth is more or less homogeneous. You see the anterior posterior boundary, which organizes the growth. Then growth slows down because it decays exponentially, the growth rate. And then cell divisions get sparse and sparse until there's some last division and everything stops. It comes out in this model without any additional input. And the same system, but now colored differently, reveals the underlying signaling. So there is that two compartments, a posterior and anterior compartment. There's a compartment boundary with an increased tension, as I explained in the talk yesterday, to stabilize this boundary line. Um, this is not a hedgehog um, secretion. There's hedgehog signaling only in the, in the tissue which doesn't secrete. The dotted cells are the DPP sources which get a hedgehog signal. And along this, this DPP source now generates a graded profile in the two directions. And it's the change of this DPP level that the cells in this simulation perceive that stimulates growth and, and generates this growth process that you see. Okay, so that's essentially, yeah. Maybe just as a final comment, from the experimental data, we only see correlations between rates of change of the signal and, and growth. Um, we would like to see a more causal relation. Of course, the theory shows that it's all plausible, but an experimental evidence that this is correct comes from the eye as a very different system that we've also uh, heard about a lot um, this morning, where we have a moving furrow um, um, in a, in a, in a, in a, towards the interior tissue. There is cell division taking place in the interior tissue into which the um, furrow moves. And in this case, we have a totally different situation. We have a moving furrow, and therefore each cell perceives a DPP signal, which is transient. And as a result of that, there's 
we don't have spatially homogeneous cell division, we get a wave of cell division in front of the moving furrow. And that's exactly sort of what is seen experimentally. And if we now use our growth rule and apply it to the moving front, we can account for the observed growth or the, first, sorry, for the observed cell division in the eye disk. Um, the black is sort of a readout of the DPP signaling. The red is the profile, the wave of cell divisions in, in front of the moving furrow. The, the, the red data and the red dash, the solid line, is the solution to our model that fits the data perfectly with a single parameter. It depends on the velocity of the, of the furrow which moves, which we can measure. Okay, with that I should stop and thank you for your attention. Because we're over time, so. Like the to repeat um, the critical the critical parameter yeah. control parameter um, it seems to depend on uh, sort of many things coming together. Right? Yes. Uh, one is the signaling that allows for this adaptive changes, yes. and perhaps that has to do with some tuning of this. Uh, but it's also that we have uh, put in the mechanical properties of the tissue. In um, is also it is also has a relation to the mechanical properties of the tissue. So is, does that imply that we have to think about a combination of these and interaction between these? I'm not exactly sure how to yes or no. Um, but clearly, this, this is an extremely complex process where all these things come together. But the way I present it, the mechanics is not very important. You, you can understand a lot without knowing everything about the mechanics. And the main, sort of the main mechanics gives rise to the anisotropy. And, but, but it's not only, not only the mechanics, it's also anisotropic properties in the tissue and the type which I have defined before. In my earlier part of the talk, I had these anisotropic tensions. They will govern the anisotropy. So that's then relevant. Um, mechanics can also have a role in the sense that if you have a local compression, that you may suppress cell division. That will certainly dampen out fluctuations in this, in this problem, but it does not govern the principal phenomena that I've outlined. So one can distinguish between the most important features and what are the less important things that also happen. Uh, in your vertex model, you uh, model diffusion of DPP by just giving DPP to your neighbors. But like, why don't you model it as if DPP is being released and is being exported out for everyone to have? There could be a profile from, from for each cell, there could be a profile from where DPP is more concentrated and the rest of the, not only the neighbors, but maybe the second neighbors or the third neighbors would have access to that DPP, DPP right? This, this DPP is not being exchanged by lateral membranes. With a model, I don't specify these details. The two-dimensional model, so the third dimension is not visible. I just have a pool of DPP distributed in the plane and which can, which can move. And of course, there are lots of interesting questions about what happens in detail. How does it move? What are the rules? How is it transported from one cell to the next? But in this model, this is, I don't have to commit to that. It is an effective model of, of transport that could uh, work with many different detailed uh, systems and processes. So when you say that the growth rate is inhomogeneous in R, does this mean that uh, it is the growth rates are stagnating once the tissue grows to a particular size? Or when you start with a square, the growth rates are higher at the center and they decline at the periphery? So growth homogeneous means that at the beginning, 
you see lots of cells dividing everywhere, and then there's less and less of them, but always homogeneous. So as the so we squared see is increasing, yeah. the growth rates are decreasing, the division rates are decreasing. Does that, is, does that The time between the, this, the, between the divisions becomes longer, yes. Okay. Thank you. And so in this case, the average area of cells is rough, roughly constant, and therefore growth rate directly translates to division rates. Yeah? You could also have division rates without growth if the cells become smaller, but in this case, the cells are more or less, they don't change very much their, their, their size. Can these uh, models be uh, applied to cancerous growth as well, where there is kind of uncontrolled uh, growth? Uh, depending on the value of beta? For the, mo for the moment, it's applied to the fly. Now we are also um, having evidence that we, a similar process may happen in, in fish, fin growth, but it's harder to pin down and to be sure about it. I personally f think of this as a very general principle which might be found more broadly, but we don't know. Question on an unrelated note, related to the patterning. So you you mentioned you showed you took this proximal and distal division of the wing. So engine and blade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that is so that is in an evolutionary context, the wing that division of proximal and distal looks a lot like how the limb is, like mm -hmm. early limb is mm -hmm. patterned in terms of gene expression. So, uh -huh. yeah, so I was thinking in that direction. Maybe that, that this might be some, in some way translate to also applications to them. It's interesting. Um, I, I don't know how similar, how big the similarities are, but it's an interesting point, yeah. The questions? But it's tired. <laughs> Went a bit over time, sort of. Okay, so let's Sorry. thank uh, Frank for a very nice set of lectures. Thank you, Frank. <laughs>